Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, we will get started in about a minute or so just to let more people join the call. Uh, but thank you for joining us today. Uh, looking forward to talking to you all about our Native Seed Bank. Okay, it's around two minutes past, so we can go ahead and get started. Again, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you all about our Native Seed Bank, uh, where we really started from and where we're going with it. Um, so again, thank you for joining us today and uh, we'll have time to answer questions at the end, uh, or if you have a burning question, feel free to raise your hand and I can uh, go ahead and call on you. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. So just a little bit about Prairie Rivers of Iowa. Uh, we are a 501c3 not-for-profit uh, located here in the city of Ames, Iowa. Uh, and our main goal is really to work to conserve Iowa's cultural and natural resources. And we do that through two main uh, programs here. The first is the Lincoln Highway Heritage Byway. Uh, it's a historic road that stretches from uh, the Mississippi River in the east of Iowa all the way to the Missouri River in the west. Um, and we manage the road and the uh, historic resources along it. And then we also have the Watersheds and Wildlife Program, uh, where we work to conserve and promote water quality efforts here in central Iowa and do some habitat uh, restoration and promotion. Just a little bit about me. Uh, I know my name says uh, Penny Brown Huber on the Zoom call, but that's our executive director. Uh, I'm David Stein. I am the Watersheds and Wildlife Coordinator here at Prairie Rivers of Iowa. Uh, just a little bit about my background. I have a bachelor's in science uh, from of environmental science that I got from Drake University in 2013 and a master's in ecology that I got from Iowa State in 2017. And kind of combined, I have a seven year long history with uh, prairie and pollinator conservation, which I try to promote here uh, at Prairie Rivers to the best of my ability. So before we get started about the Community Native Seed Bank, uh, I'll give you guys a little bit of background on some of the underlying issues that led us to establish this effort. So learning a little bit about Iowa's natural history, uh, we can start with the pre-settlement period. And you can see from the original land cover survey that Iowa's ecology was pretty varied and it was pretty intense. So in the yellow, we have our historic tall grass prairie cover. Uh, this was a really diverse matrix of grasses and forbs, small trees, the occasional oak here and there, uh, but a very, very diverse ecosystem with a lot of uh, resources for animals and wildlife and pollinators and so on and so forth. Uh, and then this was repeated in the green with forests who had their own uh, large amounts of diversity. And then dotting the landscape were the rivers and other wetlands uh, that had their own communities as well. However, if you look to the post-settlement map or our current land cover map, you can see that a lot of these ecosystems either shrank or disappeared entirely. Uh, here in the state on the right side uh, of the screen, you can see in the white, those are agricultural fields. Uh, most of our prairies have been plowed up and what grasslands still remain here are really isolated or have been converted over into degraded cattle pastures down south. So uh, there's really a large scale removal of the ecosystems and these ecosystem services that came along with them. 
So this was really the inciting factor to get more of these habitats established back on the landscape. So with that loss in biodiversity in terms of landscape, we've also lost a lot of wildlife, at least here in central Iowa. So these include lists of pollinators, uh, like the Dakota skipper, Pauschik skipperling, and Olympia marvel butterflies. Uh, some bird species, which we lost in central Iowa, uh, were the prairie chicken and a lot of shorebirds like the piping plover. And then probably most importantly and most uh, uh, famously, we lost a lot of our large mammal species. So the bison, the wolves, uh, porcupines, elk, uh, the occasional antelope that would come in from the west, uh, we lost a lot of these large mammals, which really had a large scale effect on our ecosystems, um, continuing their decline here in Iowa. But that doesn't mean that we are uh, all lost. We have a lot of current wildlife in need. Uh, so we have a couple of species that do need help here. Uh, the pollinators here in central Iowa are probably our top priority. Uh, we have some very famous ones that are here in Story County where we are. Uh, we have the rusty patched bumblebee, which is uh, one of two endangered bumblebee species here in the United States. Uh, the potential third one we also have, which is the American bumblebee uh, right next to it. Uh, we also have other endangered and threatened butterflies like the monarch, uh, the regal fritillary, and the zebra swallowtail. But we also have several bird species that are of greatest conservation need, like swans, larks, and northern harriers. Uh, we have several mammals that are still greatest conservation need, like bobcats, uh, several of our bat species, and jackrabbits. And the vast majority of Iowa's amphibians and reptiles are also listed as being of greatest conservation need. But our efforts are really focused here on the pollinators. Uh, it's our thought and our sort of idea that as we focus on habitat for pollinators, since they have so many broad and variable needs, that the rest of our wildlife will also be benefited by promoting the habitats that these pollinators uh, need to survive. So just a little other background of why we need to plant for pollinators. So uh, they are in decline and that's due to three main reasons. Uh, these are pesticides, pathogens or viruses and bacteria and habitat loss. Uh, but the main factors that we are focusing on are habitat loss, which is the majority factor, which is uh, threatening our pollinator species and pesticides and herbicides. Uh, disease is kind of a carryover from managed honeybees to wild bees, but there's really not a lot of things that we can do on the local level uh, to tackle that issue. So we focus on the other two primarily. Uh, but here in central Iowa, we have quite a few species of pollinators that we can focus on. Uh, we have around 400 species of native bees and around 100 species of native butterflies. So there's a lot of opportunity to prepare uh, the ground and prepare habitats for these uh, species that we rely on. So just a couple of trends in pollinator decline. Uh, we know that they are declining and we have some uh, benchmarks for noting this. Uh, these really kind of ramped up in the 2010s. Uh, starting in 2014, we had two butterfly species that were listed as threatened and endangered. Uh, these were the Dakota skipper and Pauschik skipperling. Uh, the Powershik Skipperling is a particularly heartbreaking case because they were named after Powershik County, Iowa, where they were found in very high abundance for the first time. Uh, but these species were last seen or not seen in Iowa since 1980 and 2007, respectively. So um, it's really kind of up in the air with these two, whether or not they are still around here in central Iowa or Iowa as a whole. Um, but planting their habitats uh, is very important, uh, especially considering that they might still be here. Uh, in 2017, the rusty patched bumblebee was listed as endangered. Uh, it still has small populations here in central Iowa, uh, but it's mainly restricted to the eastern part of the state and the northeastern part. Uh, in 2020, the monarch butterfly was denied Endangered Species Act protections. Uh, the federal government kind of kicked the can down the road for around four years um, and would reevaluate their condition uh, at that time. But uh, this has been a trend that's been happening for decades at this point. Uh, the monarch population has been falling ever since the uh, mid 90s. And last year was not any exception to that rule. And then in 2021, uh, even the managed pollinator community got a bit of a, uh, a bit of a shakeup. The Iowa colonies of honeybees experienced the highest rate of winter honeybee loss uh, in the entire nation. 
Uh, Iowa had the highest rate of colony uh, death for honeybees at 58.4%. Uh, and this was just in the winter. If you expand that out for the entire year, uh, Iowa rose by around, or Iowa lost its colonies by around 75%, again, highest in the nation. So uh, Iowa right now is kind of the worst place to be a pollinator at the moment. So really getting more of this habitat on the landscape and getting more of these resources out and about uh, here in Iowa is really, really important. It's absolutely vital to protect these species. So another thing that we like to focus on are host plants for pollinators. Uh, this is what really drives butterfly communities. So host plants are really the nurseries for butterflies. Uh, it's where they will lay their eggs and have their larvae develop into actual adults. Uh, the most famous example of this is uh, milkweed and monarchs. Uh, what the monarch will do is it will lay their eggs on really any milkweed species here in the state. Um, there are several. Uh, they will hatch into caterpillars and the caterpillars will start eating the leaves. Uh, these leaves contain a milky latex uh, bitter sap that contains chemical defenses that the monarch will incorporate into its body to make it taste bad uh, throughout its larval development and throughout its adulthood. Um, so really they rely on those host plants uh, in order to get their defenses up so they can survive into adulthood. And this is repeated throughout every butterfly species uh, here in the state. So some other famous examples would be prairie violets and regal fritillaries. Again, the caterpillar will eat the plants, incorporate some of those chemical defenses uh, to prepare it for adulthood uh, and to be toxic or at least taste bad to predators. Uh, the same thing is repeated with zebra swallowtails and pawpaw trees and white turtlehead and Baltimore checker spots. But this is repeated the entire, uh, throughout the entire butterfly community here in Iowa. Every butterfly has its own preferred host plant, so planting them really will boost their numbers in the long run. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the Community Native Seed Bank proper and get to know it a little bit and get to know our uh, role in getting it started. So really in a nutshell, this seed bank uh, was a uh, effort in 2019 to get conservation more directly uh, in the hands of landowners, really getting these landowners the tools that they needed to get some of these more natural spaces on the ground uh, on their own. So this first cycle lasted from November to April uh, of 2019 to 2020. Uh, we really just provided the seeds and provided the instructions that every landowner needed to get started and sent them home and really let them use their imaginations and use their land to get some of these more natural areas on the ground. Uh, this was really made possible by several native nurseries, four of which are shown here. Uh, we had several others that donated here and there, uh, but these were the main benefactors for this uh, effort. And really we were donation focused. Uh, we encouraged donations. Uh, they helped in, uh, increase the actual seed bank and buy more seeds, but it wasn't required. And there really was no pressure for any landowner to uh, donate if they didn't want to. Really, it was just about getting the native seeds in the hands of the landowner and making sure that these seeds uh, were eventually planted. So our main idea of why we started the seed bank was the lack of entry points that existed for people wanting to start planting more native. Uh, these entry points were really non-existent. A lot of people really just relied on their local nurseries or relied on uh, just uh, here and there knowledge from their neighbors or their families or their friends to get started. And there really wasn't a way for people to uh, take advantage of some of these native plant resources uh, outside of doing really intensive searches online or really uh, trying to reach out to an expert. So the idea here was to provide that first step for people to take advantage of to get native plants in the ground. Um, it was really a way to match the experts here at Prairie Rivers of Iowa with beginner gardeners, beginner native plant uh, gardeners, or just beginners uh, for getting involved in a seed bank or a nonprofit. Uh, we provided a risk-free trial to people that they might not get anywhere else. Uh, they didn't, if they didn't want to make the financial uh, decision to get a lot of these seeds purchased, or they didn't want to get the financial 
uh, burden of buying plugs. This was a risk-free way of getting these native seeds and trying them out for the first uh, in the first place. And it really provided us with a lot more outreach opportunities. We got to reach out to people one-on-one. -on -one. We got to meet with them in our office and we got to promote the benefits of some of these native plants uh, for the environment, for pollinators, and for people's lives. So with the seed bank, we have a couple of eligibility requirements. Um, so the main eligibility requirement is that land needs to be in Iowa. Um, this has a couple of exceptions. Uh, there are some lands in uh, Minnesota and in uh, the Dakotas and in Illinois that we went ahead and uh, gave seeds out to, but they were really on the fringes of those states and really closely bordered uh, the state of Iowa. Since we are an Iowa-based organization, uh, our main goal is really to get uh, plants here in the state. Uh, some other eligibility requirements, uh, seeds need to be picked up from our office. Uh, since we are a nonprofit and since this is a, this is a free service, uh, shipping is not available for this uh, program. So uh, regardless, if you meet us at our office, we will give you all the instructions that you need uh, to get your seeds uh, out of our office and into the ground. Um, really for uh, our purposes and for just the purposes of getting seeds uh, established, we needed to know uh, the estimated size of the garden or planting. Uh, that was needed. Um, this really helps us track how much habitat we're putting on the landscape um, and really gets our numbers uh, shareable for our final seed bank reports. And then again, donations are optional. We love donations. We can use those to buy more native seeds, um, especially from local producers. Uh, but again, it's only optional. We won't turn anyone away if they don't have a donation. So there's really no pressure to get this donation uh, given to us. So just how the process works for the seed bank. Uh, really, we start out with just setting up an appointment. Uh, really, this can be set up online or over the phone. Uh, online, we have a dedicated uh, contact form for both the organization and for the Community Native Seed Bank when it gets started. Uh, really, you'll just fill that out and let me know uh, exactly when you are available, and then we'll get a time set up. Uh, otherwise, you can give us a call and we'll set up a time uh, over the phone immediately. Uh, before you arrive to your donation or to your appointment, really you'll need to gather any materials and ideas that you have. Uh, the most important of which is your land information, uh, how bright and sunny it is, how wet or how dry the soil might be, how big the area is, um, what plants you might be looking for, what plants might be good on your landscape, um, so on and so forth. Uh, on top of this, getting your flower preferences, we publish a uh, native seed bank list uh, going forward. So uh, keep an eye out for that and you can get that, uh, you can just get an idea of what we offer and see if you have any preferences for getting some of these seeds on your land. Um, and then again, a donation is applicable, uh, if applicable. So we offer a species list. Uh, this gives you some time to research some of these species, how tall they might get, how wide they might spread, what they look like, what their flowers might be when they bloom. Um, really, we encourage anyone to look through that list and get an, uh, at least a working knowledge of what these plants might entail. So next comes the actual appointment. Uh, really, you'll just need to come to our office at the scheduled time that you set up. Uh, our office is located in very Western Ames on 230th Street. Uh, you'll come to our office and, set, and come to our appointment. Uh, really will work with you to get the right seeds uh, in your possession uh, based on your actual land. So really, you'll just have a discussion with me as the program coordinator. We'll talk about the size of your garden and use that as sort of that baseline to get you the right amount of seeds. We'll talk about the light availability in your yard or on your land. Uh, that light availability is incredibly important since a lot of these native seeds are uh, best grown in full sun, but there are some native seeds that can grow a shade. So having that idea of how much shade or how much sun is on your land is incredibly important. And then finally, having the goals for your land. So what do you want to see on your landscape? What pollinators are you trying to attract? What birds are you looking for? What other wildlife species might you want on your land? 
or whether or not you just want your land to look nice or look pretty or have a certain flower on that landscape. After that, we'll get the paperwork uh, sorted out. The paperwork really just involves a withdrawal form uh, where we'll get your personal information, uh, name, address, email, contact information, um, and then the garden size and species that you're actually withdrawing. And finally, you'll give us a donation if you have. And finally, this is what you'll receive from us uh, and what we'll send you home. So we provide seed packets, uh, individual seed packets if you want. We also provide seed mixes, uh, smaller seed mixes, but seed mixes nonetheless, uh, which will have a, a breakdown of what's actually in that seed mix. Uh, with that, we'll also provide the name of the plants. We'll provide what, what time during the year those plants actually bloom, uh, their actual bloom color throughout their year, uh, we'll get to the information about the height of the actual plants. Again, since these are tall grass prairie plants, height can be an issue for some landowners. So uh, we'll get you that information during the field, during the actual appointment. Um, we'll also get you the information about the spread of those seeds or how uh, wide their diameter is, or if they spread through underground stems or rhizomes, uh, but get you that information so you can look ahead. And then we'll also get you information about dormancy. Uh, so how long those seeds need to be kept cold before they can actually sprout and information on how to do that either naturally or artificially. We also get you a guide for caring for your seeds. It really just gives you the information needed to uh, get those seeds established in the ground and set them up for success later on. And finally, we'll give you a seedling evaluation booklet from the Department of Transportation showing what some of these seedlings might look like uh, as they start growing and give you an idea of what might be growing in that first year on the landscape, uh, just from a visual guide. And then finally, after you visit, uh, we will give you a deadline to plant your seeds. Uh, usually we work in the uh, cold stratification time. So since a lot of these species need cold, they need a month or two of cold uh, before they actually start sprouting. So we really encourage you to plant your seeds as soon as possible but no later than early April, just to make sure that they are set up for success. We also encourage you to take pictures, not only for uh, tracking the progress of your seeds over time, but just making sure that you have a record of what is on the land. And if you have any questions about what might be blooming on your land uh, starting out, uh, we can go ahead and answer those questions based on the pictures that you take. Uh, we also send out post-planting surveys uh, after the planting season. So if we set up a deadline of April to get your seeds in the ground, we will send out the survey in May just to ask what went well, what didn't go well, how we can improve the service in the future, and whether or not you are willing to participate next year. Uh, we'll encourage you to monitor the growth of your seeds over time, really, again, with those pictures and with uh, just I, uh, observations over time to see what blooms and how well they're blooming. And then finally, we'll ask that you harvest and donate seeds, maybe not even to us, but to your friends, to your family, to your neighbors, or even just to improve a wild space outside, uh, just to get these seeds established and uh, involved for the next generation. So there are a lot of factors to consider when uh, visiting the seed bank. And probably the most important ones are figuring out which plants are actually right for you. So just like a lot of living things, plants have their own specific needs when it comes to being planted outside, especially on your land. Uh, so when you're thinking about getting seeds from the seed bank, think about what factors might exist on your land. So again, the most important ones are soil moisture and sunlight availability. So with that soil moisture, some of the plants that we offer like wet roots, uh, really damp, really moist areas, and some plants like really dry sandy soils or really upland habitats where it's very well drained. So you'll need to know what land uh, you have, uh, really just from uh, your everyday observations, walking around on the land after a rain might help you determine how well it drains, uh, knowing whether it's sandy soil or clayey soil, or somewhere in the middle, it really helps you out. Uh, again, same thing with sunlight. Knowing what, uh, knowing how many hours of sunlight your land gets, it might be variable from one place in your land to another. Uh, so make sure you come with a uh, working knowledge of how much sun you might have available. And this really lets us differentiate 
between which species might be right for one place or might be right for another. Again, there are prairie and woodland species with different variabilities of uh, light tolerance. You'll also know, need to know what the previous land cover was. Uh, this really helps us with uh, knowing how compacted soils might be, uh, how uh, the land was treated before you got there or before it was developed into a house or into a yard. Uh, it really just helps us know uh, whether you need hardy plants that can really tolerate a lot of soil conditions or plants that might be a little more sensitive. And then finally, you'll need to know your current cover. So you'll need to know how to work around trees, buildings, roads, et cetera. So this really helps us choose the best seeds for your specific uh, situation. So another thing is you'll need to go ahead and uh, realize that we are providing native seeds. So these are seeds that are native to central Iowa uh, and the tall grass prairie ecoregion. We have a very, very diverse set of species, but they are limited. So if you're looking for something that might not grow here in Iowa, but grows uh, either in the Southeast or the Northeast or the Western states, we don't necessarily offer those. We really focus on planting native here in Iowa. And this is for a variety of different reasons. Uh, these flowering plants have evolved alongside Iowa's natural conditions. We all know how wacky Iowa's weather might get uh, between summer and winter and even the small slivers of spring and uh, fall that we might have. And these plants are really well adapted to those uh, seasonal cycles and seasonal variabilities. So we really try to offer those uh, as they will be the most successful. And we also know that with more native plants comes more native pollinators. So really planting native uh, throughout the entire state, really avoiding some of those not so native species will help our native pollinators out a little bit more. Those pollinators have evolved for millions of years alongside our native plants. So we're just giving them their food source that they actually prefer. Really, when you, uh, another thing to uh, keep in mind when you come to the seed bank is having a diverse set of species that you're looking for. Uh, we offer different bloom time species uh, throughout the seed bank cycle. So having a variety of those different species is really important. Uh, so different species bloom at different times of the year. Some species bloom in the early seasons around Memorial Day or earlier. Uh, species like this cream wild indigo is a very, very early blooming species. Those early blooming species are really important to help our emerging pollinators as soon as the thaw happens uh, after the winter. Again, mid-season plants like to bloom around Independence Day, uh, give or uh, take a couple of weeks before and after, uh, but the majority of our prairie species are actually in this middle blooming time. Uh, so the majority of the species we offer, unfortunately, fall in that blooming time, but we try to offer species around there as well. And then finally, the last blooming season starts around Labor Day. And these are your goldenrods, your asters, and uh, your late bloomers like that. So we try to offer as many and as diverse bloom time species as we can. But since we are in the Tallgrass Prairie ecoregion, a lot of those fall right in the middle. So uh, we try to encourage uh, planting as many seeds as possible. Um, really, when you're trying to develop a site for getting this uh, planting in the ground, uh, we like to promote the expansion of any gardens and removal of any turf that you might have that is kind of marginal or turf that you might not use uh, all that much and really develop more of a garden sense or more of an area uh, where natural things can bloom. We know that grass is great. It's great for uh, ground cover. It's great for soil health and water quality. It's great for even wildlife. They will nest in grasses, they'll eat grasses, but having only grass in one area is not so beneficial. Um, lawns like to reduce a lot of benefits that native landscapes have. Uh, there's really not a pollen or not a lot of pollen or nectar for pollinators. There's not a lot of cover for wildlife um, and keeping them short uh, kind of reduces a lot of those water quality benefits. So we like to say to diversify your lawn or even rethink your lawn. Um, it not only clears up some benefits for wildlife and pollinators, but it also clears up some benefits for your lawn. So we like to promote the reduction of your turf over time. I, we're not saying to get rid of your lawn entirely or get rid of your lawn all at once, but expand your gardens out a little bit, maybe, maybe rethink a little bit of sections here and there. Again, lawns are a little bit of an outdated concept, so we like to re, uh, remind you that 
uh, it's uh, there's a lot of space for a lot of opportunities. So a lawn can continue to incorporate lawn this can the term, the <laughs> uh, but we like to promote uh, the reduction of it as much as you can. And now we're going to talk about dormancy. This is kind of a uh, complicated topic when it comes to planting, uh, but it's a very important concept, uh, concept that we need to address so all of your plantings can be successful. So dormancy is extremely common amongst our native plants. Uh, these plants, again, have evolved alongside of our wacky weathers and our really cold winters and hot summers, and they rely on those seasonal cycles in order to actually start sprouting. So really, this prepares the plant for jump-starting its growth process quickly and as soon as winter stops. So dormancy is a period of cold that can last from 10 days to 120 days within a species uh, to get it moved through the winter and get it starting in the spring. Uh, this can be done naturally. You can start sowing your seeds uh, in the late fall to have that cold period over the entire winter just naturally, or you can do it artificially. And there are benefits for both. If you do it naturally, you don't really have to worry about space in your fridge for getting these seeds cold. You don't have to worry about uh, fine tuning any of these stratified seeds or adding more water or making sure it's not moldy or so on and so forth. And it really is more what they're naturally used to. The only problem is predators. Uh, if you stratify your seeds naturally by sowing the seeds in the ground, there's that small risk that predators can eat all of your seeds. So we like to promote that stratification happens outside naturally, uh, right before a snowfall, so the snow covers the seeds and protects them from predators. Artificially, stratification can happen. We like to recommend that you use a Ziploc bag full of either sand or uh, potting soil or things that really don't have a lot of organic matter, uh, just so there's less things to go moldy in the fridge. Um, you'll put that those seeds in that stratification medium, whether it's sand or soil, uh, in your fridge for their designated time. You can put them all together regardless of the actual time and just go off of the uh, plant that needs the most cold. Uh, your other species aren't going to be negatively impacted. It's what they're used to anyway. Uh, these are just the minimum times that they need. Um, so we promote the idea of putting them in a bag with some sand, uh, making it airtight, getting all the air that you possibly can out so you prevent molding. Oh, like um, putting them outside is a better idea. Outside is a better idea. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a lot more, it's a lot more foolproof, but we know that people have some trouble getting uh, the timing right sometimes. Uh, people are busy. There's not a lot of time to prepare the ground. Uh, so there, we like to promote artificial stratification as an option. Um, and finally, there are a lot of species that are a little picky. Um, some of these species really need ideal conditions and a lot of time. So we have species that have something called double dormancy, which makes it even more complicated. So a lot of our spring ephemerals need not only a period of cold, but also a period of hot. Since these are spring bloomers, they're used to getting their seeds ready to go very early. And those seeds will have both a summer and a winter of getting stratified and getting ready to bloom. So by the next spring, they get started. And there's even double dormancy after that. So they, there are certain species that need a cold winter, then a hot summer, and then another cold winter, and then they're ready to bloom, uh, like the wild rose. So with some of these species, it gets a little hard to get those seeds prepared and in the ground. So with a lot of these uh, more finicky, uh, tougher species, we like to promote getting plugs from a native nursery. Those are seeds that we try not to offer just because they have a lot uh, variability and they're always not, they're not always successful uh, with blooming in the ground. So when you start getting your seeds uh, or when you do get your seeds, then's the time really to make a restoration plan. And really with this restoration plan, we like to keep timelines uh, or like to promote timelines as your best tool. So this helps you prepare when to prep, when to plant, when to observe, and when to take notes and pictures. Uh, so when you do get your seeds, again, keeping in mind stratification outside or breaking dormancy, we like to get these seeds out on the landscape touching bare soil before a snowfall. Again, when the snow falls, it'll protect them from predators to the best of their abilities. 
Uh, predators really won't go and dig through very deep snow. So keep that in mind when you do get those on the landscape. Um, if you are looking at getting uh, plugs later on, you'll plant those in the spring, but seeds need to happen right before a snowfall. Additionally, when the snow melts, uh, it will start naturally drilling the seeds further into the ground and get them the start that they need to get blooming or get growing later on in the season. Um, if you have a larger piece of land, you'll want to adapt your land for that restoration process. Um, if you have a large piece of land, you are going to need to burn uh, or prescribed burn. Uh, so think about building in fire breaks or areas of low growing or green grass uh, in the burn seasons to keep that fire in one area and not have it spread throughout the entire, uh, the entire uh, field. Continuing your restoration plan, we like to promote the idea of keeping that plan going for around three years. Uh, starting from seed, uh, mowing needs to come into your wheelhouse with getting this area restored. Uh, mows will need to happen around three times a year. Uh, this really uh, keeps the uh, the plants uh, low uh, by their natural standards. You have to uh, keep in mind that these plants evolved alongside grazing, so that mowing kind of mimics that without bringing in bison or cattle or goats. Uh, so you'll want to mow your habitat around three times a year in that first year. Uh, keep it consistent to around a height of eight inches. Um, really a good rule of thumb is when it gets to be around a foot, set your mower to eight inches and mow it down that high. In year two, you'll continue mowing, uh, but you'll raise the height of the mower to around one foot in height and uh, mow it every time your canopy reaches around a foot and a half. Uh, year two, you'll start seeing some things start to bloom. So keep track of what is blooming around that time. Um, and then year three is when things really like to pop off. So in year three, that's when your habitat really starts showing the majority of its first blooms. Uh, a lot of those diverse species will start blooming and you'll be able to take some nice pretty pictures of what's going on. And if you have a large landscape, you'll want to go ahead and burn this third year as well. So really what we like to say is that most of the species that we provide are perennials. And as with anything that takes multiple years to grow and adapt and mature, it takes some time. So just be patient with getting your uh, habitat or your landscape uh, planted and make sure that you keep an eye on it um, and just have patience and you'll have a really good uh, habitat to look forward to. And finally, we like to promote the idea of climate change uh, when it comes to habitat restoration. So a misconception that a lot of people have with planting native and planting habitats to help with carbon sequestration is the first thing that their mind goes to are forests. Uh, forests are great, they can store a lot of carbon, but that carbon is mostly above ground in the trunks and branches and leaves of trees. When you plant a prairie, a lot of that carbon is directly inserted into the soil through their root systems. So a lot of these root systems are very dense, they're very deep, and they form a lot of organic carbon. So we like to promote the, uh, really just the restoration of all of our ecosystems since they all have a role to play. Uh, Planting where a prairie once was into back into native prairie will be very beneficial. The habitat will be healthy, uh, but planting a forest into what might have used to be prairie might not be the healthiest thing that you can do. Um, and just to give you some idea of how much prairie can affect climate change is that an acre of diverse prairie has the potential to store 1.8 tons of carbon per year. So this is a continually growing and storage system that can really be beneficial uh, as more people adopt some of these practices to get more native habitat in the ground. So again, we're just trying to help that out through our native seed bank uh, and get this on the landscape to help uh, in any effort that we can. So along with the native seed bank, we also have some other services. Uh, these really involve habitat and garden design services. So with this, we like to uh, Use this as sort of the second step after the seed bank. Now that you know what to plant and now that you've started planting native, this is the next step that you can take advantage of, uh, of from Prairie Rivers of Iowa. So we do plant recommendations and site analysis. And really it is again, a free of charge service. We like to visit land and get to know what the land is like. And 
sort of reintroduce you to your land and some of the underlying uh, variables that your land has associated with it. So what we can do is we can assess the current land use. We can see what might be going on on the landscape uh, in terms of what's currently there growing, what invasive species might be there, and what, uh, it, what the potential of that land could eventually be. Um, we work both in town and on the farm, so really there's no land limit. Uh, we like to work more local, uh, but if you are here in Iowa, we can help you out as best as we can. So this really involves a one-on-one -on -one assistance uh, field visit with a natural resource specialist, which is me. Uh, I'll come onto your land and I will uh, ask you a couple of questions about what the history of the land was, what your goals are for the site, and what you're really looking for um, in terms of getting this into uh, more of a garden or more of a landscape sense. Um, and I'll also try to research any cost share or any uh, programs that can help you, uh, that can assist with getting some of these uh, native plantings on the ground. Uh, we'll also give you a packet of information, including the soil data, uh, the historical land cover, some old aerial photos, just to see what was there beforehand and really get the conservation practice started uh, moving forward. And uh, if you're looking at smaller landscapes, we can also get you a garden design again, based on your land's needs and land soils. So just a outline of what this might look like for a larger piece of land um, outside of just the garden service, uh, we provide information like this. So we take a look at the underlying soils data. We take a look at the historical data and we can then see exactly what ecosystems can be planted where. So this was a property from the city of Ames that we analyzed. And we gave, them, we gave the city some ideas of what could be planted and what benefits they might have. So this was a very, very diverse site. It was around 60 or so acres uh, to the west of Moore Memorial Park here in Ames. And we analyzed it for what the potential for restoration could be. So the majority of the site was in wet prairie at one point. Uh, this was in a floodplain. It wasn't forested prior to settlement here in Ames. So looking back, we have some ideas of what could be planted here and what could be benefited. So we have a select list of wet prairie species, including sedges, gentians, some milkweeds, Joe pieweed, uh, really a large wet tolerant list that we gave the city of Ames, which could help promote the development of other wildlife species like Northern Harriers, monarchs, and a lot of our amphibians and reptiles. The second largest system here was the Mesic Prairie or kind of in the middle of that uh, soil moisture uh, spectrum. This is the most common prairie that we have here in Iowa. It's kind of that uh, all encompassing uh, kind of stereotypical prairie that you might think of. Uh, it has a lot of different species of grasses, a lot of different species of forbs and flowers like coneflowers and uh, wild bergamot. And what that ecosystem once restored can benefit are some of these grassland birds like Western meadowlarks and Eastern meadowlarks, um, things like badgers and foxes, and then some of our uh, native prairie butterflies like the Regal Fritter. We also had a small section of sand prairie. This is a very rare ecosystem here in central Iowa. Uh, the sand prairie was deposited by the river coming through and depositing pretty light sand. This is a very dry system, very low levels of soil moisture, so it has a very unique ecosystem that you might not see until you go to more of the Western states uh, like Nebraska or Colorado. So some of the rarer stuff actually blooms here like cacti. Uh, we have several species of native cacti in Iowa. Uh, you'll usually find these in these sandy, dry uh, sand prairie sites. Uh, species of yucca, uh, which you might not see until you go out West and then even sagebrush. And like the Western uh, habitats, these also promote uh, some Western animal species, things like jackrabbits, uh, box turtles, and even reptiles like uh, skinks and race runners and other lizards. So a very rare ecosystem, but restoring it can help promote some rare wildlife to come into that. We also had oak savannas. These are kind of the areas between prairies and forests. Uh, and like a transitional zone, it has the characteristics of both forests and prairies. So you'll see large, uh, tree species like oaks um, and hickories, but you'll also see prairie species uh, like lousewort and nodding onion and other flowering uh, plants and grasses. 
Uh, so it's really that transitional zone. And it also has a lot of unique animals that call them home too, like wild turkeys like to live in oak savannas here, um, barred owls and other birds of prey uh, like to use the old dead standing vegetation of those oaks for nesting habitat. And then you'll have some butterfly species that will uh, use the trees as their larval host plant, but then as adults move down into more of the prairie flowers and uh, prairie forms of the understory to use as adults and the cycle will repeat. And finally, we had forests in this site. So these are the most uh, light limited areas uh, here in central Iowa, but they are also very unique. They have a lot of spring blooming flowers uh, that like to bloom in May and April. Um, they also have nut producing trees like hickories, they have maples, they have hackberries, and a lot of these really tall, uh, uh, wet and dry tolerant uh, tree species. And with this comes a lot of different animals like woodpeckers, uh, other butterflies that feed on those hickories and those oaks uh, and those maples, and then our mammals like raccoons and uh, opossums and squirrels um, and so on and so forth. So with this site, there was really a lot of opportunity to get a lot of habitats put into place. And just by doing a, just by restoring a 60 acre site, we were able to get a lot of these uh, wildlife and uh, plant communities uh, competitive and in the best shape that they've been in quite a long time. And this can be repeated over and over and over again. This is not a very unique site in Iowa. It's just a site that was open for restoration. So if you are a landowner with a larger area, uh, feel free to reach out to us just to see what might be possible in the future. And who knows, you might have just the same amount of diversity and be able to do the same amount of wildlife benefits uh, that the city of Ames was able to do. With that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the uh, webinar here. Uh, we have around 10 minutes or so for questions. So feel free to either unmute yourself and ask any questions that you might have uh, or type it in the chat box. Uh, otherwise, here's our contact information. Again, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, I will take any questions that you might have. Doesn't look like we have any questions yet. Um, again, uh, feel free to go ahead and either email or contact us at, at your leisure, uh, and we'll be able to answer any questions. But uh, one last call for questions. Otherwise, we can go ahead and end early. Uh, this is Diane Fowles. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. OK. Um, I have uh, some small, uh, very small prairie uh, about Oh, about six, seven acres, uh, I've, and it's in its third year. So anyway, I've I've always left the uh, the stems and the debris of bergamot and um, um, you know swamp milkweed, all the stems um, and and the debris I have left because um, it's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I've left it over the winter. Okay. Yep. And and. Um, so, uh, but I've heard recently that um, that that sometimes that's not a good idea because um, damaging leaf hoppers and and other um, insects uh, also overwinter and can um, damage uh, these these wildflowers. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm my I guess I, I have my question is. Um, which is better? Is it better to just bite the bullet and leave all the debris there for the pollinators uh, and the um, insects to overwinter and have some place, or is it better to get rid of them? And one and the and the thing that's got me really concerned right now is on my um, purple coneflowers. I'm noticing some um, aster yellow. Yeah. So. To get to your first question, um, the best thing that we like to recommend is to do both. So with some of these prairies, you'll need some of that dead standing vegetation for overwintering sites for those insects and pollinators, like you said before. Um, but you can also uh, split your prairie 
uh, a little bit here and there. And if you want to cut those down, only do one section and then leave the other for that overwintering uh, habitat. So when we talk about either haying a prairie or burning a prairie, um, we like to say that we keep it on a three year burn cycle, but that doesn't mean you have to burn or hay the entire thing. Uh, we like to leave a little bit here and there as sort of a refuge for those insects and those pollinators to escape to and then utilize for their overwintering habitat. Um, they, that they'll really benefit from any dead standing vegetation that you might have, uh, but feel free to uh, either hay or mow or cut down uh, what is uh, necessary to cut down over those three years. Um, really just having a site that's cleared will allow more sunlight to have more flowers bloom in the future, and a site that's left will allow more pollinators to use those new plants that eventually bloom. And then can you repeat that second question again? Oh, uh, well, it, I, it's really not much of a question. It was more, um, I'm really concerned about leaving um, the dead vegetation now because I'm noticing aster yellow on my echinacea. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to get rid of that, but um, I understand that, that that can be quite a challenge, especially if you're trying to get rid of the roots also. Yeah. So with that, really, again, this comes into, uh, this comes into really just trying to get rid of those roots as best as possible. Um, it, it, it takes a long time and some of these invasive species can be very detrimental, but getting that, uh, keep it, keeping the site healthy through those uh, prescribed mowings or prescribed burnings or cutting those things down every once in a while to add some disturbance will really help the overall ecosystem health. So, uh, Keeping the entire ecosystem healthy uh, rather than focusing on one thing is probably what we would recommend a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Are there any other questions? I have a quick question. Yeah. How did you, um, how did you get the community's attention about the seed bank? We are still learning. Uh, so the original way that we got it was through uh, both Facebook and Craigslist. Uh, Craigslist was probably the most successful since we added it to their free column and we really got the word out that way. Um, it really helped with just uh, the everyday person, either at work or just perusing through the free section to get in contact with us. Um, and then Facebook was the next thing that we promoted it on, uh, again, through their marketplace and through some of these uh, more naturally minded uh, Facebook groups uh, we promoted the seed bank on. Um, and then also we had uh, a posting on the native plant listserv. Uh, that I think is organized by one of the universities around here. I'm not 100% sure on that, but they passed it around to some of these uh, people who are very interested in getting some of these native seeds on their land. Um, and we were able to distribute a lot to those uh, listserv members. Um, and then finally, it was through word of mouth. So we would occasionally get calls from people here and there saying, oh, my friend, told me that you give away free seeds or, oh, my, my cousin visited you guys last year and now she has a beautiful uh, new prairie that's starting and I was hoping to get seeds. Um, really, we're just trying to find the best way to do this on our own. Um, but those were the successful ways that it happened in the last couple of years. But we're still trying to tweak and find the most successful way on our own. Um, and we're, we're struggling a little bit with that, but uh, we're hoping that hopefully as we use all of these in tandem with each other and as more people start to visit the seed bank and tell their friends and family uh, that we'll get more people signing up. So year over year, how long, how much um, growth has there been? Um, so in the first, just from, a, from an acre standpoint, in the first year we had around 50 or so seed bank 
takers um, with uh, restoring around, restoring or enhancing around 30 or so acres. Um, in the second year, we had pretty similar numbers to people who showed up to the seed bank, but the acres kind of exploded exponentially. Uh, we had, I think, around 120 acres that we applied seed to. So uh, the takers from the seed bank didn't really uh, grow all that much, but we had a lot more acres that we were able to help out. Um, and we had a lot more donations from, late, from native seed companies that second year as well. So we were able to get a lot of those acres uh, more okay. established. Okay, so how did you get to the native seed planters? What did you do, just uh, set a proposal in front of them or what did you do? So the first year we actually just sent emails. Um, this was really a pilot project, uh, just getting it off the ground. Uh, a quick email to some people about the program uh, really was a way to get those initial takers. Um, a lot of the seed companies were really, really ecstatic. They loved the idea and uh, it helped promote their business eventually. Um, some of the other uh, seed companies were less enthusiastic about that, um, but we respected their decision and uh, took them off our email list. Uh, the second year, we actually sent out formal letters uh, kind of explaining what the process was, what this program was, and uh, how much habitat we put on the landscape in the previous year. And we got quite a bit more in terms of uh, donations that year. So uh, I think the letters or the formal letters were a lot more uh, beneficial, but really if you're starting up a program, a quick email and discussion online really helped out for us. And the content of this letter, how was it worded? Was it? Um, it really just started out by introducing us and introducing the program. Uh, we then talked about the success that we had in the previous year, uh, saying that with the help of seed companies like yours, we were able to reach out to X amount of people and restore and enhance X amount of acres um, and really just promote the benefits that this might have on the landscape, especially uh, here in central Iowa, where a lot of it is agriculturally dominated and there's not a lot of native habitat, uh, using that as sort of a draw or sort of a hook uh, for telling uh, some of the seed uh, producers that this might be a beneficial thing um, would, be, would be something that we put in our, uh, our letters. And also saying that, uh, uh, kind of giving them the incentive of uh, showing where some of these seeds come from and giving the names of some of these companies uh, it helped. It helped for them to get their name out there as well. So Great. having all of that language in there really helped. I think that's wonderful. Thank you for the information. Yeah, no problem. David, I have a question. Um, maybe you covered it, but I wasn't. I didn't listen to all of it. Um, what do you do about burning? What do you recommend for burning for a prairie that's been established for probably eight, ten years? Ten years. So the the really rule of thumb that we like to promote is burning on a three-year cycle. Um, okay. And with that, don't burn everything. Always keep a little bit of section away from that burn, either through a fire break or just uh, setting it aside somewhere and keeping that available for insects and other animals to escape to. Um, mm -hmm. But there's also the new idea of burning as much as you can. Uh, we've spoken to some of the national ecologists at NRCS who have stated their successes with burning as much as they could. Um, one of the national ecologists said they burn probably 60% of the years. Uh, really, it's just keeping in mind what you have uh, time to do and what you have the funds to do. Um, if, as you burn more and more, not everything will burn. The fires will be a lot less intense. And there will be natural skips in the landscape to keep some plants uh, undisturbed rather than burning everything after year three and kind of starting from scratch again. So it's really up to your personal preference. Um, I, when I was in school, I always learned the three-year cycle, but I'm being introduced to more and more uh, conflicting opinions about that. So I think it's really just keeping in mind what your preference is and how much time and how much energy you have to uh, 
uh, apply a burn to your land. Um, I probably wouldn't do it every year, but I would maybe do it every other year, or even if you're comfortable sticking to the every three year cycle, you can keep doing that. Okay, so when you say a three year cycle, if you divided your prairie into three parts, mm -hmm. you would do one part each year. Yes, that's an option. Um, for larger landscapes, that's what people like to do. It keeps their, uh, it keeps the fire sort of limited and it keeps their uh, time a little bit limited as well. Um, mm -hmm. But if you have a smaller landscape, uh, burning the first year, keeping it going for two years without a burn and then burning again that third year uh, is another okay. option. So it, again, it's up to how much land you have and really how much energy you wanna put into a burning project. Mm -hmm. um, with splitting it up into patches that you burn uh, every once a year for three years, um, it helps have that wildlife area that they can escape to. Um, but again, you have to burn every year, which is which yeah. can be which can get to be a little bit of a headache. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I, I yeah. understand. Okay. <clears throat> Dave, this is Bill Vogel. Uh -huh. um, what's is there any advantage to uh, a healthy prairie to just come through and mow it? I have a bush hog that doesn't mow, you know, like a lawnmower. Mm -hmm. It just whacks stuff down. But uh, is there any advantage in going through like in the spring and and uh, kind of getting the air, getting the sunlight close to the ground and so forth? Yeah, so mowing can be an okay alternative to burning um, or an okay mimic of burning. But with getting it mowed, you'll have to go ahead and get all of that biomass or all of the things that you mowed off off of the landscape, just so there's more sunlight to actually get through. Um, okay. Really what the mowing is trying to do is it's trying to mimic both fire and grazing by getting that uh, vegetation off the landscape. But you'll need to have that area for getting sunlight down into the soil or down into the understory to get the new plants uh, starting to grow. Okay. Okay. In other words, don't leave a lot of refuse laying around. They can't grow through that. Yes. So if you do mow, uh, do it in place of burning if you would like, uh, but get that vegetation off the ground. But And I wouldn't recommend mowing and burning at the same time. It's kind of an either or situation. Okay. So it's around 7.03. I think we'll go ahead and end there today. Uh, I want to thank everyone for, again, joining me uh, with the Native Seed Bank uh, overview and a little bit about planting when you get your seeds. Um, again, if you have any other questions, feel free to give me a call, an email, or reach out to us online, and we'll be happy to help you out. Um, the seed bank should be set to open over the next two weeks. So we'll go ahead and send an email out to everyone who attended uh, this uh, webinar about when it starts up and you'll be the first to know and first to have access to the seed bank for this year. Um, again, thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your day.